You know, it's, it is a really big deal when it's baby's first big trip out of the house, right? And, and to make all the success that you can, you have to do lots of preparation. And the first is with baby himself. You, you got to get a fresh diaper, snap up the onesie, then you, you have to put on the outfit that Aunt so-and-so gave. You have to take a picture, post to Facebook so she knows he's wearing it that day. And then you got to, you know, put him in the car seat, which it's, as a new parent, you really don't know how the straps work. I mean, you brought him home in it, but how did it all work? And his head's all floppy, so you, you finally get him in. You put on that little cap that the hospital gave you for a newborn, and, and you're almost ready, except somebody reminds you, diaper bag. Oh, yeah. So then you got to make sure there's, there's diapers and wipes, a changing pad, uh, powders and ointments and creams and, and uh, you know, wipes for your hands. And, uh, and then an extra outfit in case there's, you know, a blowout or a burp up. You know, you, you just got to be prepared. And, of course, you as new parents, first-time parents, you're not going to be there on time. It's just too much out of your normal routine to know what, how soon you needed to start working. And besides, there could be a last-minute little accident you got to take care of. And, and to be honest, you're so sleep-deprived anyway, you should not be driving anywhere fast. But, but finally you make it, you know. And I, I can only imagine that that first big outing for for Jesus was certainly a lot simpler to, to get him from here to there. You know, as he walked the earth, I mean, they literally walked the earth. And we have him pictured here on a donkey, but probably not. We don't know. But it's a five-mile walk from Bethlehem north to Jerusalem. And as they make their ways, I, I'm sure that, you know, lots of, of perils along the way. But they were doing it because that's what the law required. You know how first-time parents are. You know, well, what are you supposed to do? And then you follow that. You know, you're not into deviating against the sage advice of those who've gone before you with your first one. Second or third, okay. But the first one, you're at least going to do everything by the book. And the book required that you show up at the temple with an offering to buy back your firstborn. So they, they were all for that. You know, I can... I could vividly remember being in St. Joe's Hospital with our firstborn. And, and it kind of came time where we're going to have to take her home. You know, and, and it just kind of really struck me that, oh my goodness, should they do that? Should they allow us to take this child, this human being home? We really don't know what we're doing here. Um, I mean, it's so nice to see the nurses. And they just flip the baby around and they, they change it. There you go. And this is how you do it. And they show you and like, okay. And, and then you try it and the legs are all, you know, and it's, it's crazy that first few times. And, but then it, it, the moment comes and they're kind of like, well, you, good luck with that, you know. And okay. But of course at home... You know, you're not going home to an empty house. At least we didn't. There, there was people there who, who knew how to take care of human beings because they'd taken care of us. You know, grandmas and grandpas were there, and, and they, you know, and after they came and went, you could always call them up. Say, well, we got this, this rash. You know, is this a rash? We, no, no, that's, that happens. You know, just put this on. Okay. Well, when, when do we start feeding, you know, all solid foods? Oh, it's okay. That's, that's a ways down. You're, you're good. Okay, huh. And then you're reading everything, all the sage advice of those who've, who have gone before and written it all down, and whew, you, you think you're going to be okay. Well, Mary and Joseph, they make their way to the temple, and lots of sage advice was waiting for them. Yes, the, there was an, uh, a... Uh, prophet there, and Simeon, who had been led and directed by the Holy Spirit, and they had a lot to say to the new parents about their child. Not so much parenting advice as what the destiny is for this baby. Now, I know as firstborn parents, you don't want anybody just grabbing your baby. I mean, even if it is a church, I mean, okay, you know, but Simeon just takes the child, and, and he's got all these wonderful things to say. And, and then, you know, like at church, there's lots of people that got to come up and see the baby too. And there's Anna. And it's like, oh! And, and, but it was more than just oogling a new baby. And as the parents heard about what was going to happen, they marveled that this child, that the angels sang about, that they had 
re uh, had conversations with about this child, now people are saying as well, well, he will be the glory of your people Israel. He will be a light of revelation to the Gentiles. He is the answer to prayer for all those who have been waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. He is the Messiah. And that's, that's a lot to take in. It's not like he's going to get a good job. You know, this is more he's going to be a nice boy. No, this is, wow. The, all of history has been leading up for the Jewish people for this moment. And he's the baby. And okay. And, but of course there are darker, more ominous things to say that would haunt Mary's heart. That this child will cause the rise and the falling of many in Israel and the thoughts and heart of hearts, many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. All those who came though, all of them offered such positive and encouraging things from the angels that filled the night sky to the shepherds who had to see to now Simeon and Anna and then the magi who would come to worship the king. They all agreed and encouraged that this child is the one and yet this dark cloud also would hover in the distance and grow ever closer because death would be following this child. They would have to leave, of course, Bethlehem before they had ever planned and, and escape with their lives because, of course, King Herod sent his soldiers to kill all the babies in Bethlehem because of this baby who was born king of the Jews. But finally, they make their way back and they return to Galilee, their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and and filled with wisdom and grace of God was upon him. You know, as first-time parents, sounds like they were doing okay, right? You know, things are, things are going to be all right for them, at least getting him up to adulthood. Well, it's kind of funny because I was at uh, Wesley Hospital earlier this week making, you know, some visits. And, and in fact, it was over to your mom. So, and while I was in the, uh, the elevator, this lady just spontaneously starts a conversation with me. And it's just me and her, so I'm thinking, ooh, okay. And, and, and she starts just gabbing on about, you know, what she is and what I'm going to be doing. And I just shared with her, well, I'm, I'm writing a Christmas Eve sermon and I'm writing this sermon. And, and she goes, oh. And she just, she didn't stop the elevator, but she kind of stopped the conversation. She says, well, don't leave him as a baby. I thought, oh, okay. You know, I didn't even tell her what I was going to be preaching about it, but okay. I mean, you kind of get the sense that she had had enough baby Jesus sermons in her life, you know. And like, don't do that anymore, you know, preacher. And okay. Um, well, of course, Jesus is, he grew up, you know, and we get that. Um, and, and he did fulfill his destiny. He, he is the Messiah who would suffer and die for not only the Israelites, but the entire world. And his resurrection from the grave now proclaims objectively that he is the Lord, the Son of God who's come for us all. He's the King of the universe, King of kings, Lord of lords. But you and I are taking him home. Not because he needs infant care. Okay, the lady made her point. I got it. But you're taking him home and now what will you do with him? I mean, it just seems irresponsible not just to do anything with him, just to leave him on his own. You know, it, it, as if you had an infant in the house, it takes just as much devotion and sacrifice and time and sleepless nights and study and interest and love and give and take and, and effort that a newborn is certainly to have Jesus in our lives in a day-to-day -day basis. And... Fortunately, there are many who have gone before us who have given us sage advice. The prophets, godly women and men. And what we have before us is some very um, powerful words in Colossians chapter 3. And they are wisdom, not righteousness. Righteousness is what you do uh, so that God will love you and forgive you. They're not righteous, they're wisdom. This is a very wise way to live now that you've taken Jesus home. And I have found them to be so important and so uh, life-directing uh, that I, I've memorized them. In fact, 
the whole chapter from 1 to 17 of chapter 3. But I'll, we just have in this reading 12 to 17, I want to share just a few of them so that you might also see the value in them. That as Jesus is now a part of your life, all grown up and the Lord and Savior, what does life with him look like? And it looks something like this. Because the passage begins, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. I've been talking a lot lately about how much God loves you. And this is why. Because he does. All right? But nothing else really will form your heart the way God intends without this very first thing, that you are one in whom he dwells and delights. And that you are holy, not because you've done holy things or you've made up for the unholy things, but you have been made holy. The sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood shed for you, it's, it's covered all of your sins. You are holy and you are chosen. You're not just a random pick either. You're not just an also ran or, okay, you know, this is the group I'm choosing. You have been chosen by name in your baptism. I know the day and the month and the year I was baptized because of this, because I've taken these words into myself so that I can, I can really focus that I have been chosen and I've been made holy by the death and resurrection that I am loved. And now the rest of this all comes together because of Jesus. And now, you have clothes to wear. You know, like you, you'll, you put on your baby clothes on your baby and the ones in it. Well, you've got clothes to wear because of this baby. It's compassion and kindness and humility. I learned it as meekness, but I think this says gentleness. Think how powerful it is to have this outside of yourself, this compassionate heart of Jesus now available in you. And where this really finds its feet and its power is in thinking about the other people of your life that you're irritated with, that you're mad at, that you're hurt by, that you don't want to be around, that say stupid things, that, that just ridiculously have lived their lives or have hurt you. And now, rather than hardening your heart, there is a compassion. It's not because you tried real hard to be compassionate, but you have now received Jesus. And here's the clothes for you. And there is kindness also. Now, kindness isn't just a politeness, but it flows out of this compassionate heart. You, can, you don't have to judge everyone. You don't have to have your way. There's a humility and there's a meekness that's now here because Jesus is with you. And then patience. Like, oh, I wish I had more patience. You know, you know well, I have to try to be more patient. You know, you never pray that right because God will give you a chance to be patient. Well, it is something that you receive. And bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. You must forgive as Christ forgave you. It's not like a big law, this is what you have to do, but it's, you have been forgiven. You have been set free. You, you must. It's, it's just it's what you got to do. Not because it's the law. It's just what your heart compels. It's what love does. And it's a resource from God. And forgive. And, and all these virtues then put on love, which binds them all together in perfect harmony. You know, just think about this, this entire garment and all these are held together by a love that is a love of God, not based upon what another person will do for you or what they're going to make up to you, but simply that you love them because you love them, because you are loved simply because you are loved. It goes on, though, the, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts and minds, for you were called to peace. If Jesus really is the King who's resurrected and reigning over the universe, He reigns in your heart to give you peace. Not as the world gives, but a peace that you don't have to justify yourself anymore. 
You don't have to be a certain thing or a certain kind of person to finally prove to the world that you're worth it in your job and in your smarts or whatever it is. You've been now set at ease and at peace. As God says, you're justified. Your existence is justified. Your presence is wanted. And then let the message of Christ then dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is how, when Jesus comes home with you, life in its, all of its gifts are lived. I give you the challenge, not simply to hear this, but to actually memorize these verses. And if you want to go all the way back to verse 1 to 17, but the, the value isn't in simply learning them or memorizing them, it's in actually using them every day. What you do by memorizing them is it places it in your heart and makes it available, and then to pray them. And I've been praying this for about a year and a half, most every day, and, and it's just such a an amazing resource of Jesus in your life. I invite you into that. As you consider, as you make your intentions for this coming year of what you're going to be and do, I invite you to pray about it. And so to Jesus be all glory. Amen. We stand then to confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed.